What's up, Dragon Ball Super Star Arnie was illustrated by Ashan Anime Art and written by him alongside of Wolfsbane101. So show your support for them on Twitter, DeviantArt, and everywhere else you can. This excerpt brought to you by Kenny's Ice Cream, KIC. It's been one year since the Tournament of Power came to its conclusion. The events of Broly and Moro have yet to take place, if they will at all. Android 17 had wished for every erased universe to be brought back into existence. But what he didn't know is that by making this wish, not only did the realms just fall in the contest return, but also the six others that were erased long ago by Lord Zeno. On Earth, meeting up for possibly the first time in quite a while, Goku mentions to Vegeta that it would be a good idea to begin training their young sons themselves now. The prince admits this is the first sensible thing he's ever heard out of his rival, but questions why now suddenly? Having plenty of time to absorb the impact of the Tournament of Power, Goku notes there were a lot of strong fighters they were up against. If something like that happens again, it would be smart to have the boys in their corner next time. Not to mention, the potential of Gotenks has only been scratched upon. Vegeta sees this as well, surprised to find a rare moment they're actually agreeing on something. At Kame House, we get our first look at Goten, having gone through some changes in the last year. As his father, per norm, has to beg Chi-Chi to let them train, and it seems like this isn't the first time the couple have discussed it today, his wife only reminding the only reason she even agreed for the three of them to come here was so they could do so, but so she herself would be able to keep an eye on his studying. Hunching over to Whisper, since things aren't exactly going their way, maybe it's time for a quick escape. The boy doesn't object, zipping away to who knows where, leaving Chi-Chi to scold her husband, or at least the ghost of him, shouting for him to get back here this instant. Venturing to a wasteland, they meet up with Vegeta so they can all train together, explaining to the kids the first exercise is to achieve the next Super Saiyan form. Vegeta furthering the reason for this is to improve their power and rage as Saiyans. Once that's achieved, it'll be time to control that power and rage. Harnessing their key, the kids are eager to get started. And so, the training began. For the first time, the boys were pushed to their limits. While Trunks and Vegeta had previously trained together before, it wasn't directly focused on the former's development. After about three weeks, significant progress was made. Goku admitting they really gotta hand it to him, mastering Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2 in a mere 20 days. Vegeta feeling the same. While Goten is a spitting image of his father, Trunks takes on a slightly different look than what we're used to. When we find Piccolo searching for the Saiyans overhead, but what could he possibly need? Spotting him below, his and Goku's eyes meet, surprised to see the Namek. As he touches down, he's asked if he's come to watch the kids train. Goten greets his one-time sensei, saying it's been a while. Responding, Piccolo remarks it's good to see him training hard. Getting straight to it, Vegeta questions what brings him here, and surprisingly enough, he explains he's come to request a favor. Wondering what that could possibly be, it's revealed Piccolo would like to travel to the world of Beerus to train with the Saiyans. Goku is elated to hear this, as he was always under the belief that Namek was a self-training type, mentioning if they bring him along, he will need some sort of offering for Whis to be accepted as his disciple. But already aware of this custom, Gohan was kind enough to pack some Indian chicken curry for both the Angel and the God of Destruction, figuring it's probably something they've never had before. Happy to see they have one less thing to worry about. Vegeta chimes in, deciding since they're going there anyway, it would be wise to see if the kids could be trained by Whis too, since he and Goku were able to make so much progress there in such little time, and given the potential of their children, they would likely benefit from it more than they. Knowing it isn't the greatest idea to slink away from Chi-Chi again, Goku thinks he better get permission first, being so far away and all. Though his son argues they've already snuck away once, why would this be any different? And not having to expend much effort to convince him, the next phase of training is soon decided. When Goku asks Piccolo if Gohan showed any interest in training too, under the impression he's been sparring with him the last year or so, and while the Namekian did request he come along, he declined. Training here on Earth gives him the opportunity to stay fit, but more importantly, it's still close enough to spend time aside Videl and Pan, and of course get to his job and all. Disappointed, Goku knows not much can be done. With nothing else, Vegeta resolves to get the kids back to Capsule Core so they can tidy up, and to see if Whis will even take them to Beerus' world. Meanwhile, in Universe 9, Sidra's world, the deities are seen lamenting. 
The Destroyer and Kaioshin do, however, find solace in the fact they still exist after Universe 7's wish. And now, they'll even have the opportunity to raise the mortal level in their realm. When completely unannounced, the Daishinkan appears, to the great shock of the pair. Bowing in respect and greeting him, he assures there's no need for such formalities, as he has traveled here to discuss something very important with the two of them. Ro questioning what seems to be the matter. It's explained. It's come to his attention, since the Tournament of Power has ended and this universe has been revived. He and Sidra have not been performing their duties very well. After not meeting their doom, the Daishinkan is led to believe this put them under the impression they had all the time in the… well, universe now, causing the duo to become lazy. Greatly apologizing, the God of Destruction assures they'll fix that immediately, not withdrawing his concerns. The Grand Prix states it's the wish of the Omni Kings, they're given the time of 90 ticks to at least somewhat improve the mortal standings of this universe, or else they will both be replaced by a new destroyer in Kaioshin. Though Ro argues, in all due respect, but 90 ticks isn't nearly enough time. But the Dashinkan cannot go against the wishes of Zeno. The choice is to surrender their positions now or accept the allotted time. Sidra questioning, even if they were to give up their titles, there are no candidates in this realm to replace them, inquiring who it would be, which is something that's already been tended to. Revealing is Frieza of Universe 7, who will assume the role of Destroyer, as he's been training with Kamfari, the Angel of Universe 3, for the past six months. They have also arranged the proper studying for Anukai by the name of Deus, who is currently residing in Universe 10 with Goasu. The two of them are ready at the helm to be ushered into their roles. Naturally, the pair gaff at the mentioning of the name Frieza, completely unsure what qualifies the tyrant for such a position. The priest details that during the previous six months, he has shown much dedication towards the laws of destruction and has taken an oath to fulfill the duties when they are bestowed upon him, so he himself sees no issue in appointing him to the task, suggesting they not worry about that at the moment, as the clock is ticking, so it would be best if they got started on fixing the mortal level of this universe. If they manage to do so, even if it's just by raising it by half its current standing, their jobs could be saved, expressing they will meet again when time expires bidding them good luck and taking his leave. Ro continues to fixate on 90 ticks not being nearly enough time. Sidra not wanting to displease the Zenos, questions what they can do. Mojito comments he believes if they work hard, the Omni Kings will recognize this and possibly grant them more time. Asking a Supreme Kai what he's got in mind, the Kaio believes he may have just the thing. Completely ignoring the angel, he proposes the hypothetical what if there wasn't a contender to replace Sidra as the God of Destruction? Mojito already not liking where this is going. The Destroyer beckons what he means, furthering. If there is no competition, then he cannot be replaced, hence they will obtain more time. But since Frieza is primed to assume control, what can they do? That's when Rose suggests they have him assassinated, to the shock and horror of Sidra. While the Angel merely mutters, that's not a very good idea detailing his plan. Since Kaioshins and Destroyers are binded as a pair, one cannot exist without the other. If Frieza were to be exterminated, there is no meaning for Akai to be in training, as he would not have anyone to be linked to. While it is most likely easier to just take out this Deus character, chances are he is permanently residing at Goasu's temple, where Frieza may wander off alone from time to time, believing this will be the best opportunity they have to save their positions. The Universe 9 Destroyer is in, but begs the question, who could be strong enough to challenge someone like Frieza? Mojito only smacking his head, knowing that Ashinkan won't be very pleased with this. Regardless, Ro carries on, deciding it'll have to be an outside party and the Grand Priest will never find out. It's first suggested they hire that hit guy from Universe 6. After all, he is a professional when it comes to stuff like this. But the Kaioshin has someone even better in mind, a warrior called Kane from Universe 14. Coincidentally enough, he is actually Hit's son. The Destroyer liking this idea, as he remembers meeting him just over 600 years ago, before 14 was erased. Giving us more information, Ro explains how Kane is the right-hand man of Syra, the god of destruction in that realm. In fact, Syra even took it upon herself to train him, so one could assume he's even stronger than Hit, requesting the Kaio hand over his crystal ball to contact this other Destroyer. The duo seems set on their ill-advised plan. In Universe 14, Sidra has just finished explaining to Syra their request, introducing us to her angel, Noir. 
Alas, she's not willing to lend Kane's services for free, asking what they offer in return. Before hinting she is a collector of rare items, perhaps they have something along those lines they'd like to present. And Sidra has just the thing in mind, proposing the last of the Layashi no Mizu he has in his possession. Shocked he'd be willing to part with something so valuable, turns out. It's a mystical water that can heal any sickness or injury, and even bring life to a barren land. Noting these guys must really want this Frieza individual dead, causing her destroyer colleague to remind what happens to gods once removed from their positions. It's a fate even worse than being erased. Unable to resist the opportunity, Syra accepts the offer, telling them she will inform Kane of all the details, and also equip him with his own crystal ball so he can report straight to Universe 9. Directing, he merely send the Layashi no Mizu through Godmail. With the terms settled, she turns to Noir, requesting he summon Kane from his training and inform him of the situation regarding Frieza. With nothing to add, he complies, gazing into his own crystal, alerting Kane he is sending details of a job to be carried out in Universe 7, and to kindly report to Syra's world immediately. Entering a version of the Room of Spirit and Time in Universe 14. We get our first look at this Kane fellow, and sure enough, he definitely resembles his father and is more than willing to take on some new work. Rejoining our heroes, it seems Whis has agreed to take on the new students, instructing the boys to carry the waste to his right without transforming, who, optimistically, believe it's gonna be easy. The angel then tells Piccolo to do the same, who's just as eager to get started. Addressing the elephant in the room though, Whis firmly warns Goku not to make a habit out of bringing his friends here to train. This is the world of the Great Destroyer, not merely some wayward trading ground for mortals. And the bribes of delicious food will eventually run its course. Giggling, Goku can't help but throw Vegeta under the bus, claiming it was actually his idea, who quickly denies the cheap shot. Which brings the angel to his next points. He can tell that the prince here has been training diligently this past year, where Goku has been slacking off again, pointing out he believes Vegeta actually has the edge on his rival at the moment. Either way, Goku is happy to test this theory out, Vegeta not one to deny. Turning to Piccolo, Whis goes on to dictate since the boys can't go Super Saiyan, he's not permitted to remove his weighted gi. Getting to work, our newcomers run into the same surprise as their fathers did, unable to budge the weights even an inch. Piccolo not faring any better. Taking notice of the Saiyans beginning to spar, their mentor worries it'll wake Beerus, calling for him to go all out and make it quick. This way, it will enable Goku to notice the difference between them. While that normally isn't his style, he can't wait to see what Vegeta's been hiding. The boys and Piccolo also stopping in place to see how this goes. Powering up to their max, we're met with a Super Saiyan Blue form. Though, Vegeta seems slightly different. Goku immediately pointing this out, explaining the prince scoffs that while Kakarot here was off farming and relaxing, he achieved this new state, donning it, true Super Saiyan Blue. Monologuing, Whis explains to Goku this is what he was talking about earlier. This new state of blue is more powerful than the one they're accustomed to. Additionally, it can be used for longer periods without the massive drain on stamina. Vegeta has also taken on the slimmer, younger looking appearance as Super Saiyan God. Admitting, as much as he hated it, he actually used Goku's own method to reach this form, trying to stay calm and using Super Saiyan Blue as long as he could, even while asleep, just as his rival did before facing Cell. Ready to find out what this true blue is all about, Goku charges! Incredible! Even though both of them are going all out, Goku hasn't been able to land a single blow on Vegeta. His speed is insane! Proud of his evolution, the prince smirks, quipping if he sees the difference in their powers now, while Goku tries to contain the blue aura inside of himself while simultaneously fighting. Vegeta doesn't have to put an ounce of focus away from the battle, as he can contain it effortlessly. Like only he can, Goku admits he probably hasn't beat this time, not believing he can match him at this new level. Having seen enough, he powers down to his normal state, ready to start his training here too. This newest revelation only serves to fuel Trunks' ego, his father being the strongest now and all. But bickering like kids do, Goten argues had his own dad been able to continue with his training, he would be stronger. 
and thinking to himself. Piccolo second guesses his decision to come here, seeing just how far behind Goku and Vegeta he still is. Whis, demanding attention, informs the carefree Saiyan he will now go through the same training as Vegeta did, so he too can achieve the true form. Since he still cannot activate Ultra Instinct at will, it would be best to chase what is known to be obtainable. It could also act as a stepping stone to one day master Ultra Instinct. In Universe 7, Sidra is correct in his assumption Frieza would wander away from his training. With a cocky grin, he announces to someone, For you to pass all my gods undetected must mean you're not here to talk. Spotting a sinister presence lurking in the shadows. Of course, who we know to be Cain. And returning the smile, he confesses, The Emperor is correct in his assumption, as he has come here to kill him.